Ross, and um, I'm very, very proud and pleased to present the last of the panels for uh, this summer uh, here at Longhouse. Hi, Jack. Uh, I would like to uh, just say a th few things before we get started. Number one, thank you to Longhouse for this weather. Oh, my God. <laughs> like... It's just extraordinary. I feel like we went through like seven weather systems this morning and landed on this. It's great. Uh, I wanted to thank Jack Leonard Larson for hosting these events here. It's really been uh, incredibly special to uh, thank Matko Tomicic, uh, the executive director, Wendy Van Dusen, Diane as well. Um, and... Uh, very happy to be back. I also wanted to thank um, our underwriters, um, without whom we, it would really be very challenging to do this. So Big Geyser, David Abudi, and Alpine Capital Bank, Michelle and Marty Cohen, Geek Hampton, Eileen O'Kane Cornreich, Sherry Sandler, Tag Associates, and Tina The Store. And a very special thank you to Harbor Woods Guesthouse uh, for housing some of our, our artists this year. Um, so uh, this has been really an amazing journey, having started the panels last summer. So much has happened since the first panels in July last year. It's kind of, uh, it was unforeseeable what would transpire with women in the workplace. And um, I'm very grateful to all of the women who have participated, um, who have taken times out of their incredibly busy schedules. Um, and as a reminder, uh, the series is dedicated to my mentor, Elaine de Kooning, with whom I spent uh, quite a bit of time here painting and drawing and being with her group of friends and having my own private uh, graduate school, which was really extraordinary. Um, so Barbara Toll is our moderator today. I met Barbara earlier this year at one of the other panels we had done at my restaurant, Nick and Tony's. And uh, she, I, I, you can read her bio in, the, in your uh, program, so I'm not going to read off her extraordinary list of achievements, um, but she is an independent curator and um, dealer now um, and sits on some really interesting boards. Um, but Barbara came and sort of turned the panel into a group conversation, and um, it was really a very special um, conversation and very participatory. And I went up to her afterwards and immediately said, would you moderate a panel for us? And uh, she very graciously said yes, and that she wanted to do a panel of sculptors. And so here we have uh, four uh, sculptors who are going to talk about their work today. Um, and I'm just very grateful to Barbara for saying yes and for... Uh, having the number of transactions and emails that we had to, to create this panel today. So um, I'll be back at the end. There'll be like a 45 minute discussion and then there'll be time for Q&A and a little time to meet with the artists themselves. And thank you all for being here and for coming over the last uh, year and a half. When we decided to organize this panel, um, there was in my mind, the idea of keeping it unified, not just having a group of, of artists discuss what it was like to um, um, create careers in the art world as a woman. Um, I graduated from Pratt in 1969 with an MFA, and there were almost no women sculptors. Uh, there were some older models, like Louise Nevelson, or the relatively unknown Louise Bourgeois, um, who was better known as scholar Robert Goldwater's wife. Uh, Eva Hesse was practicing. Artists like Linda Benglis and Rosemary Castoro were actively making work, but not exhibiting yet. Uh, the words woman and sculpture were an oxymoron. Much has changed. On this panel, we have four women artists whose medium is sculpture. Originally from St. Louis, Kennedy Yanko. Um, sculpture look mis looks misleadingly traditional. I feel like I'm, I've got feedback here. Um, ah. 
Her folded metal with paint skins brings to mind a softer John Chamberlain. However, the work involves welding and a large scale uh, process where she peels paint. The paint that has been heavily applied to a surface and peeled off is then folded and draped within a lot of her um, structures. She combines the performance. Now there's nothing. Hello. <laughs> she combines the performance of manipulating metal and paint with her body to form work that is both powerful and totemic. She recently returned from an exhibition at the Lion Decker Gallery in the Canary Islands and will exhibit this spring at the Denny Diamond Gallery on the Lower East Side. Brie Rouez uses her body to gauge her work. Pushing clay out to match her arm lengths and weight, she physically manipulates her medium and then reduces it to manageable segments before glazing and firing it. The landscape of the desert inspires her. She goes to the west to get in touch with nature and the colors of her medium. She will have an exhibition in the spring at the Chelsea Gallery Freedom Benda. Um, also, Brie just had a work acquired by the Art and Embassy Program. Uh, for uh, the embassy in Mexico. Alice Hope's work is urban. Even though she lives in the Northwest West Woods, her material is used metal, primarily but not exclusively can tabs. Her work is both additive and minimal. It appears extremely polished and urbane, but it is made of reclaimed detritus plated garbage cans, door frames, and bed springs. Her humble materials become glistening ropes of colored metal wound into spirals or hanging from the rafters. She was included in the exhibition Heavy Metal, Women to Watch at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, which closed earlier this month. Her most recent project is a large labor-intensive work for the Art and Embassy Program at the United States Embassy in Mozambique. Sheila Pepe's um, approach to sculpture is more encompassing. Her installations include massive hanging crocheted environments, which are easily transportable and change according to the architecture in which they are shown. Most recently, Sheila is having a mid-career retrospective, which originated at the Phoenix Art Museum and will open at the Decartava Museum. Uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts as its final venue. Working as an educator as well as an artist, Pepe includes participants in some works. Uh, they pull strings and change the dynamics of the installation. She sees her work following in the tradition of Judy Pfaff and Nancy Spiro, both of whom transform space with ephemeral materials. But all four of these artists have carried on the tradition of women artists of the 70s. Their work is post-minimal, installation-oriented, and uses economy of scale. There may very well be a gender-based reason that we don't encounter much bronze sculpture by today's women's artists. So I have some questions for the panelists individually, and then I hope we can begin to um, uh, talk amongst ourselves and with the audience uh, about some of these issues. Um, so for Alice, I'd like to know how you feel about working as an artist uh, raise, and raising a child, which I know you have a daughter, and although she's grown, uh, how did you manage to deal with her upbringing uh, and make your art at the same time? Um, my daughter uh, now is... 25, but when um, it, when she was pre-verbal, she, she has an amazing sense of self. She did communicate to me that it's okay for me to make art, so I, I didn't have <laughs> her fighting against me, but I, um, I did have to use my time very wisely, and I think being a mom, I was really pushed into an additive process. She, I, she went to grad school with me. I, I joke with her that she's already gotten her MFA. She, um, so, but being at grad school and she was a, a three-year-old, 
every moment I had in the studio, I had to account for at least. Um, and so that's one reason I'm, my work is very additive, is um, the, pr the, the reality that I only had so much time to work. The other part of, there's many reasons my work is additive, but that's a significant um, push when, when she was young. The other um, thing I did was I got up at four in the morning um, for many years before she got up and then, and the other thing I did was I started adapting materials that were child friendly or at least weren't toxic to her being around. And so um, I w was a painter and I used oil and turpentine and that was hard to be additive in the car if, or wherever I was with Soren. So um, I, I developed a process that I could take wherever I went. Um. And, and also uh, in talking about the additive quality of your work, um, I wondered if you could speak about the tradition of accumulation in a lot of women sculptors and artists' work, um, like Tara Donovan and Liza Liu, and people who, in some cases, use communities to make, uh, to help make their work and encourage them in in their practice, or, um, you know. Uh, I think what you said right now was very interesting that it's portable and that you could you you could you didn't have to devote a specific space and time uh, in adding to it. But is that the way you felt about um, um, the question? Is the question is uh, do you see your work as part of that tradition? A tradition? I, I, absolutely. It's the, the, what I find most moving about additive sculpture is the opticality that's created when. Um, an overwhelming number of the same thing is in the same place and the concentration and density of that. So that uh, has been a primary force is just, and then also when I get to a certain place with, um, in the making, the work starts, it appears to look like it's reproducing itself. Like there's a biological phenomenon in mm -hmm. the embedded in the work. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm strict and using just one material over and over again. Great. Um, and Sheila, um, I know your work has a kind of impermanence in the sense that, um, well, bronze sculpture doesn't, um, but your work also involves accumulation mm -hmm. in a very different way than Alice's does because it's more free form. Um, and um, did, did you start to do this work for a specific ideological reason or did it just develop organically? Um, well the, the work that I kind of jumped out into the art world with were small objects and wall drawings and light and shadow. And at a certain point when I realized that my contemporaries who were working in a similar fashion were all attributing their precedence to the work to men, mm -hmm. I thought, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to crochet, Lynn, what are you going to think about that? Right. <laughs> and, yeah. So, um, yeah. What's, it okay. was, for a little while, not a very good idea, yeah. um, but has turned out to be fine. Um, mm -hmm. I think that both of those sensibilities are uh, realizing that if I can carry my, the parts of my work around in a, in a uh, two, uh, shopping bags or or two suitcase roller suitcases and put them on a on a plane or FedEx something ahead there's a certain economy to this that is um, sustainable in a life that I think um, it, it's about if it's about women's work in that uh, we're still making a, s a por smaller portion of the dollar than the men are. So there's a awareness that um, gender and, and economics are still tied in an un unusual, I will just say unusual way. Um, <laughs> but it's also because I realized that I, I wanted to and I needed to make a bridge with second wave feminist techniques 
um, Faith Wilding being mm -hmm. one of the precedents that I lean on, um, mm -hmm. Faith Wilding's womb room from the woman house in, in LA. Um, I think the accumulation thing that like I, I can I can tie a shoelace, shoelaces end to end to end to end and they can signify both something human scale but also industrial. So I still want to be able to own Daddy Duchamp, right, with the ready-made. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me it's um, a, a way to take up space without um, doing it all at once, mm -hmm. to imagine the space you're going to take and then take it. Mm -hmm. um, and the temporality of it is also an indication of the tentativeness around taking up that space. Um, I also think that the, um, the longevity of the materials, fiber, it's ironic, you know, you could put a bronze sculpture out in acid rain and leave it untouched and it will corrode and be gone. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you can have a papyrus from, you know, the early kingdom of, of Egypt and it's still with you because you're taking care of it. So I would say material care and longevity is relative. Right. And I think right. that's also part of the message that what you think is strong <laughs> might not be and what you think is weak and temporary is not. Well, you, you pretty much answered the other questions that I had for you <laughs> <laughs> without asking, so that's great we because I guess I was on the right wavelength <laughs> because I wanted to know about craft and feminist theory and I, I wanted to know about the fragility of your materials, and so that's, that's great. Um, so there's time for other women. Yes. We've just made space, <laughs> you and I. So Bree, um, I wanted to know how you started to use your body it's as, as the measurement for your work. And do you think being a woman um, gave you physical limitations as you approach this material, which you push and spread out and, and then have to really fire in segments because it's too massive? to work with it otherwise. Right. Um, so I started working with the body because it's, um, sorry, it's really weird to hear your voice back. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it, the, my body is both a tool, not my body, but the body is a tool and the subject of my work. Um, I consider the body the site of all of our experiences of the world and how we perceive um, physical space and um, experience it sensorily through our body and um, our experiences are both physically embedded on our on our bodies but also um, in our in our brains um, and so that for me meant working with um, clay um, kind of became a stand-in for the body and using my body as the tool, I needed to kind of scale up in terms of the proportions of the, the marks that I was making to the size of the work. So using my body weight was, it seemed like a really logical leap. Um, and through that, I was experiencing this, I, I, when I make work, it's in a burst, it's very fast. And so pushing my body to that extreme is kind of a, a way of getting in touch with, um, I'm sorry, I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> well, I think of it as, I think of your work as a gesture in a sense. It's almost an expressionist uh, way of dealing with clay. Right. Um, and I know that sometimes you've used other people that you're involved with. Uh, and use their weight against your weight, and there's a whole kind of system to how you approach moving the clay right. around. Yeah, and, and, and that process is, um, is tracked entirely by the clay. And so I think pushing my body to the extreme kind of allows people to have a visceral experience of the work, that, um, that, there's, like a that there's a connection to materiality, um, that there's 
a, a very sensorial experience to the textures in the work. Well, your fingerprints are all over the work. Right. And, and you know, there's in, in a lot of art and most basic art theory, you know, people tend to use their bodies as measurements in the, you think of Leonardo's Vitruvian Man and um, the idea that you don't really reach beyond yourself unless you're making something that's so enormous that you need ladders and, and so forth. So I just wondered at some point whether you would consider using assistance or whether the sense of the scale of your, your personal reach is really part of your work so intrinsically that you wouldn't change that. I think that the unit is really important, that unit of measurement. So yeah. I don't know that my work would necessarily get to a scale that would require using assistance, but what I have found is that the material is pushing my body to become stronger, to continue to make yeah. it. And I've had to start taking Pilates classes and <laughs> weight training mm -hmm. and it's like upped my game and it's making me aware of my body in a way that I hadn't been before, right. um, which is a really strange um, sensation or, you know, the experience of being really embodied and well, as well as being really connected to material, my material right. surroundings, right. Right. it's like all very intertwined. Um, but I do have an use assistance to help me with the manual labor, yeah. which is the really taxing part. Um, of the cutting and firing and glazing wedging and clay, wedging clay and mixing clay right. and carrying 50 pound boxes upstairs right right, and right. yeah there are, you know I mean there are men who who work in clay but it tends to be a more um, women woman's medium for some reason and uh, and it may be I, d I don't know what that reason is but a lot of things that you just talked about about grounding yourself I mean I think they're very not feminine feminist ideas. Yeah, no, I think yeah. like someone like Michelle Stewart, although she doesn't work in clay, that idea yeah, of kind did. of using yeah. the earth as yeah. the material, as your your main language, um, that that's the literally ha how we're connected to this. Rooted in the ground, yeah. yeah. So Kennedy, I know that um, in your earlier life, <laughs> you, <laughs> Um, you worked with the Living Theater, and which is a very performative um, commune, basically. And I wondered how that informed your work, because when I was in your studio, I really felt very strongly the sense of performance when you showed me the paint that was inserted in some of the materials that you had to physically push them and, and be engaged in the work, which was, uh, although it was welded, was not you know, at a distance. It was very much close to your body. And um, and you think that you, early, early on working in performance really significantly um, affected how you work now? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll give everyone a little bit of history about the Living Theater first if they're not familiar with it. Um, but the Living Theater was an, uh, an avant-garde pacifist anarchist theater company started in 1957 by Judith Malena and Julian Beck. And you know they were at the forefront of the movement of um, experimental theater work. Uh, and they had people from Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and Ann Waldman um, to Bob Dylan and Jim Morrison and, and uh, all different kinds of, of actors and artists and producers in their space. Um, so I had dropped out of school and I ended up doing a four-year residency with them and I think I think my time there was um, it was profound because it, it taught me a new way to think about philosophy and and a new discipline and a new th and a new practice and, and like how I'm engaging with my community and understanding that um, but also really like an endurance uh, because we were working Nonstop. I live. We lived in the theater in the Lower East Side. I lived in the dressing room for four years, and um, between the AV room and there were like ten of us, and we were taking care of Judith. So, I think that time was more intensely focused on just like making through it, getting through the day, and and I, I was kind of pushed into performance. Um, when I went to Judith, I was originally wanting to network an installation and just be in New York, um, but I ended up performing with them. And I think that the the things that we would talk about. Um, from philosophy to understanding how, how movement is the beginning of an expression. 
uh, it gave me more of a dialogue around my work that I don't think is normally in um, like sculpture classes or painting classes. Um, and I think that's, that's how it really influenced me more so than uh, understanding my body because that was something that was always uh, relevant and important to me. So I know that um, you told me that you began to work in metal when you moved into the neighborhood where your studio is right now and you became really friendly with all the guys in the welding shops and they taught you how to weld, which I guess having a background in theater um, may have helped because you're really out there and you know, a friendly kind of artist. <laughs> so I just wondered if you chose to, to move away from metal because you're in that neighborhood. I mean, you're so much, your work is so much a part of where you, your studio is, is situated and I just wondered what you could see as your next step. Um, <laughs> I, th I think in my mind I'm always kind of like 10 years ahead of, of what I want to do and what I want to do next. And, um, you know, the artists that I'm, I, I've always looked at and that have, I'm inspired by, like, Ofra Liaison and Anne Hamilton um, oh, and, yeah. and being uh -huh. involved in the performance uh -huh. work. Like I'm uh -huh. very much interested in, in the viewer's experience. I see. And I notice a lot of artists later in their careers, um, they'll go into, like, film or they'll try to find the way to be as triggering and as quickly as possible to affect their audience. Um, and I I, I'd, I'd like to find ways of doing that. When I came to Judith, my my proposal was for this these like light box installations that would wash over people and be, you know, really experiential. Um, within my work though, metal is all I'm thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. And I actually had to take a step back from thinking about more experiential projects and installations, um, and focus on this so that I could create more of a space and a, and a um, like a streamlined dialogue for my career before I could get involved with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was talking to Rishi Johnson recently, yeah. and I was trying, I was having a little trouble understanding how I can get my installation work and my wall pieces to be. Um, more together, you mm -hmm. know, and he said that in, it, the 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 conversation that you're having with yourself and the things that you're that you're thinking about and studying, like that's the installation holds that space for you, um, and that was like a revelation for me. So I think with my my installation work, working with performers, um, beginning to think about making more experiential moments for people, that's more of a, a like a process of thinking, and that's something that'll always be apparent and and keep my my practice juicy and excited. Mm -hmm. Um, but other materials wise, I'm just, I'm kind of like sticking with the elements right now. So mm -hmm. for everybody, everybody at, in this panel works differently, but obviously gender has been a very important aspect of, of your work, whether it's about your physical limitations or your physical experience or the kind of work that you actually may make that's related to traditionally to women. Um, I was just wondering how how do you do you see a change in attitude towards the idea of woman and sculpture um, today, or is it just another medium and just another form that is now gender more or less gender neutral? So, I, it, anybody can respond to that. I guess I'd, I'd like to touch on that. I I, I just think the the idea of, of physical limitations is a yeah. strange thing to think about because mm -hmm. I don't think that I have physical limitations yeah. right now in my yeah. life. Um, and as an artist, I, I don't always think about myself as a female artist. Right. And I, when I'm working with other people, you know, like when I was working with the, the welder, with the guys right. at the shop, right. I didn't feel separated in any way until someone else told me that I was. Uh, um, so. And I, you know... We're, it's a really interesting time right now because this past year, the past two years, everybody wants minority, female, queer artists. Like the the more no, it's, singular it's, you get that's about, true. It, like that's I you think know, it started in the nineties. It did, but now <laughs> yeah, it's just but like it's really have, blossomed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we are indebted to all yeah. of the work that um, every uh, every artist and every woman has done mm -hmm. to to get us to this place where we're starting to feel this like climatic experience yeah. of women. I think it's. Um, it's refreshing for me to see it picked up again because we know there have been years where nobody would say the word feminist or uh, even say that being a woman has anything to do with their work at all. But I think in truth, it's, it's, we've, you know, we've, we're in a, 
in a universe now that is admittedly completely constructed, and so our, w this is not an essentialist question anymore. It's a it's a culturally constructed question, mm -hmm. and um, the that construction has to do with us being women, but it also has an economic piece to it. It has a it has a full range of gender issues and sexuality issues, and it has a serious race component to it as well. So as we touch upon the woman part of it today, yeah, well, I think it's very important that we evoke all of those other aspects to it in terms of not physical limitations, but cultural limitations. Well, it was always interesting to me that uh, Elizabeth Murray, for instance, um, did not want to be exhibited in any show that was just limited to women. Um, on the other hand, she decided that she wanted to have children and, and conduct having a career. Whereas, for instance, there was just an article in the New York Times about Ree Morton, who has an upcoming exhibition, and she specifically left her family to become an artist. So I think, you know, there are, in, there are theory, you know, in theory, it shouldn't, your gender shouldn't matter, but in practice, your gender matters. But, but respectfully, I'm, yeah. You're, you're saying that uh, to have children or not have children is the key. No, uh, no, I'm just saying that it's something men don't, you know, artists, uh, men sculptors don't. That's, yeah. That would be the essential aspect of womanhood. And for me, uh, <laughs> I've never wanted to have children. And I come from an age of lesbianism where, oh my God, I'm a lesbian. It means I never have to worry about having children. <laughs> And for the <laughs> lesbians who do have children, I witness to all the efforts they have to go through to have them. So, um, y you know, I, I'm still the individual kid I was yeah. when I was yeah. 10, and I'm still playing, yeah. you know, with stuff in the same way. And I think that's, um, that's a gift. If I can call up that 10-year-old, yeah. I know I'm a very lucky person, right? But, um, you know, I think that there are other aspects of the cult culture that we all share in terms of, it may be because of ch children, but time management is something that we probably all have to deal with because it's hard to make m money being an artist. And oh, so, yeah. so, so we are being dragged in a million different directions. and. Please. I wanted to com or elaborate on like another social construct that it yeah. seems to be a problem, or I was discussing. It's interesting that a lot of our work breaks down and that there's maybe a bit of an anxiety about taking space, and I think that women tend to be <laughs> more socialized to be less confident about taking space or... Um, mm -hmm. So for m me to be a sculptor, it is kind of putting myself in an uncomfortable situation and it is a statement about occupying space and trying to get more comfortable with that. And to see so many of my peers making sculpture, is of uh, my female peers yeah. making sculpture is really exciting. Um, and that there is a cleverness to the way that we're doing it um, in considering economic limitations, but also yes. um, physical. I mean, I, I don't feel that I have physical limitations, but I, I've also been socialized not to really ask for help. Um, and Agreed. that asking for help is seen as a weakness. Um, mm. So I've ma like developed my practice to be entirely self, almost entirely self-sufficient where I can move, deinstall, install every aspect by myself. But it's interesting because you were studio assistant to Sarah Say and you know her work is so ephemeral that you couldn't imagine that she would need a studio assistant to move it and yet you perform that function for her. So well she she's working on such a <laughs> expansive scale but yeah. it's interesting her work comes apart. It all com I mean it's so lightweight. Yeah. It's, yeah. Even the, even the stones which are, mm -hmm. you know, faux. Yeah, so, right. they're yeah. made out of yeah. paper. Yeah. Well, I was but going to evoke um, Judy Pfaff in that way. Mm. Yeah. And she's both a welder and a, I mean, she, she takes up space. She with, takes up a lot with of With serious space. materials <laughs> yeah. but that don't go away. 
but Ke but Kennedy is specifically on this panel the person who who really makes what looks like more traditional sculpture. It takes up a kind of a, a space and place in and that you have to really circle around. Whereas in your work and in Alice's work, you walk either walk through it or it's on the wall, and your work is pretty much on the wall. So you know, in you're more. I see you as, as really performing a kind of different sculpture that's been always labeled more masculine in a funny way. Well, I think yeah. it's kind of interesting. I really liked what Sheila said earlier about the, the tentative idea of taking up space or like how you're thinking about going into it. And I think the, the longer I've been working, the more I realize my work is really a projection of myself and the things that I'm dealing with. Um, and like I'm constantly trying to put myself out there more and take up more space and be more bold in any way that I can. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's uncomfortable and scary. And um, I, I was just wondering, Sheila, if you could talk a little bit more about that idea of like the tentative. Uh, it's yeah. I mean, when it started, um, when I started hanging things in space and not working on the wall, um, you know, people would show me how many square feet is this. I'd go do a site visit, or I'd get a floor plan and some JPEGs and. I would have to test, like, how big actually is that? And I would over, I would ship way too much material mm -hmm. because I just thought, oh, it's enormous. I'm never going to fill it. Um, and then I'd get up on a scissor lift and start driving around, and it was like, oh, I'll be fine. I have plenty of stuff. <laughs> and I like taking up space, right? I li it's fun. I like doing this. But it's all contingent on the architecture, on the event, on all of these other things that I think are part of the illustration of both of um, the socialized thing about is this okay to take up this much space? Literally, I feel this in my body every day. Is this okay mm -hmm. to take this much space up? Um, and I'm like, yeah, it's actually quite fun. Um, but also, um, the desire for it to someday not be contingent, not be hanging on the space, but be from the floor up, which is a totally different expression. Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about all of us is that you, we are dr draftsmen over here, we are drawers, and you two are painters. Oh, that's interesting. Because yeah. of the way you use the wall yeah. and... Yeah. Um, and the way you yeah. use color, yeah. where you, you kind of use color sometimes, but we could do it with a black line and we'd be fine, <laughs> right? Um, and I think that we are at a moment where sculpture and painting are having a, a, a reversal of yeah. some kind. For years, there was a lot of sculpture and there was a lot of sculpture and performant, performative sculpture and painting was on the back nine. And now it's switched, I think. I um, just wanted to add something about tentativeness and um, space. That, um, Andrea Grover did this, started this series called The Roadshow, where um, local artists came, where it, she helped local artists find alternative spaces to show work. Um, and that really got me thinking about um, how to show work, and if we we aren't if we don't get inside, and it's not exactly that we're marginalized, but how to sh continue to show work um, outside of the the white box. And so I've I've run with that a little bit, and I've noticed that there's a large part of our real estate that being the ceiling that um, that is unspoken for. And so it, it's there's an adaptive element in terms of continuing to exhibit and wanting to show and wanting to grow. And that, uh, that I think that adaptation, tendency to adapt is also constructed as a female right. um, attribute. Right. So I wonder if anybody in the audience has any questions about for the panel about any of these topics or anything else? Um, I'd like to ask Kennedy how large her pieces are, but um, 
So, so the question is for Kennedy, how large her pieces are? Um, they vary. Um, my smallest pieces are, um, I do work with, with marble um, and wood and metal. So my smaller pieces are like this big and that big. And then I just did an installation that was 12 feet by eight feet and it came onto the floor. Um, but it varies, it depends, yeah. Mainly, mainly about the size of my body. <laughs> Still. Still, yeah. it's the size of your body. Just about, so yeah. We're, we're, yeah. Five eight one fifty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. My mother taught me. <laughs> Pretty easy. My, where did I learn how to crochet? My mother taught me. My left-handed mother taught me. Very. She was very oh. proud of teaching her right-handed daughter how to crochet. <laughs> her, her large achievement. It's true. Anybody else? I'll, I'll repeat. Um, Jackie Brody just said she own, owns a piece of Sheila's that's traveling that's quite small, that's in, in the retrospective. Yep. And there's, a, there's a large body of work that few people really know about. Um, they're collectively called votive moderns, and they incorporate small groups of, um, you know, I've, start, I've been making them since 94, and they've just gone on and on, and it's a it's a grand desire to have a scale of object that I grew up with, which is the tabletop Madonna, and, um, and to have them be as many different kinds of things as possible over time. And so the piece that Jackie owns is literally a small drawing in space. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's black and bluish, grayish, yeah. Thanks, Jackie. Hi, ladies. Um, thank you guys for sharing. Um, question I have is, when you have this like work that you're doing, it's amazing. How do you deal with like pricing for your work? Because it's like something that you enjoy, and how do you find the value in it, or like charge like the right amount? <laughs> find an expert. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a Barbara Barbara helps. <laughs> that's a perennial problem, but I think uh, it's a serious question in one respect in, in that both Alice and Sheila make installations which are not really as possessable, and um, they have been sold, and I think that's a negotiation. Well, but uh, every installation is a commission. Yeah. So every exhibition that has an installation in it has been a commission, which is another way to think about it. So in the beginning, it was important to, because of my own philosophy, it was important to keep the cost down and get me some money. I couldn't break, I had to break even at least, and depending on who I was working with, whether I really wanted to work with them or not, or they were super poor or had a few bucks, it was old fashioned lesbian sliding scale for a long time. <laughs> still is in a way. If I really want to be there, I'll be like, just cover my cost. But, um, but my whole sense of pricing is part of my ethics and it has a relationship to small scale capitalism. Um, but, you know, it, it's different when you make different kinds of objects. Yeah. I don't make this kind of, I haven't made this kind of objects or forefronted to them, put them in the forefront, because I have other political things to do with my work. And Alice, your your large scale work has pretty much been commissioned as well. So I I think that these works that seem more ephemeral, you know, it's important that there that there is some support in, initially for them. And uh, I think Bree and Kennedy both have objects that can be sold, possessed, and maybe resold. <laughs> which, you know, increases the, the value and can raise the price level as your careers uh, go on. But of course, you know, pricing has to do with an awful lot of things, and a lot of intangibles. It has to do with, you know, where, you, where you've exhibited, what kind of um, museum shows you've been in and so forth. So it, that's a, a sliding scale. And it, the more you exhibit, the more it, it usually goes up. Uh, any, anybody else? marble uh well you know so my studio is in industrial brooklyn and in williamsburg 
And uh, I was walking down the street one day and I, I walked outside and there was this beautiful marble factory and um, I went inside and I asked them if I could go through their, their uh, trash cans. So I was, I was using whatever they threw out. So a lot of my work is out of trash cans. <laughs> So it's, it's sustainable in the sense that we were talking about before, you know, and it's kind of, you're, you're not, I mean, you're using the things that have been thrown away in any case, and then you're putting them together. And I think, you know, you're using mud, basically, and, and uh, Alice is using the parts of cans. Uh, so I think there's some, some commonality here. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Yeah, there's a man in the back. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, I was fascinated with what you had to say about, about taking up space uh, at the size of your work, what it took up in the gallery, and also with your bodies. And I think we all, as women, have been trained to uh, take up less space than men. It's presented as more attractive. Um, and I think if you even look around the room, you'll see that a male is usually pretty straightforward and the way men stand is very square. And the way we tend to sit in what we do with our spines is smaller. And we also smile a lot and agree a lot and nod our heads a lot and use our hands a lot. Uh, but we were trained to do that. Uh, and it's very fascinating sometimes to just take on a slight male posture in a social situation and see if that makes someone a little uneasy. <laughs> I think there's a gentleman back. Hi, ladies. Um, my my question, uh, I'll frame it like this. You usually notice in nature, um, animals. Usually, the female is the one that goes out and hunts and 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 brings the food and shares with the family and shares with the community. Um, can you talk a little bit about sh how working with other artists has been as a female, both working with uh, women artists and uh, uh, male artists as well? Could you talk about the dynamic and some of the differences and things that you've noticed? I've worked for a number of artists actually and I've found that the female artists that I've worked for are more likely to play a mentor um, type of role, and um, and and then extending to my own hiring of assistants, there's a, a kind of value of them as artists, but also uh, uh, economic value in what they're doing. So I I pay a wage that I you know that is good for New York, and um, that's really important to me in terms of sustain sustaining other artists' um, lives. We have another question. First, thanks so much for sharing those insights and, and stories. Uh, I'm thinking that since progress or change is rarely linear, I'm wondering if we met a year from now and had this conversation again, how you think or would like the conversation to have changed. Mm -hmm. I, I want to start by saying um, for real change, a year isn't very much time. Um, so, you know, maybe a conversation about um, the difference between constructed realities and essential realities might be a good one. Or maybe we're just a whole bunch of people who happen to be women, and now we're talking about race. You know, I would like to talk about my whiteness most of the time. <laughs> and because I feel like I've made my peace with being a woman in the world, and I've figured out a way to do that. But as a white woman, I'm, um, I'm still learning how to wake up every morning and remind that, my, remind myself that, because I don't, I don't. It's not like when I was a young dyke and had to, I didn't even have to think about it. It's like, oh my God, I'm going out into the world and I'm a lesbian and it, I don't have to think about that anymore in the places I go. So I, I would say a year from now that we were talking more about the intersection of feminism and racism would be a really good place to be. 
We have another question. I feel awkward asking because it's disproportionate men asking the questions here um, relative to the audience. So thank you. Um, you guys are really extraordinary. Um, and the sharing is fantastic. I'm, I'm curious if you have felt you've spoken a lot about the limitations um, and the obstacles you face. I don't know, because I don't know what it's like to be a male artist. <laughs> and that's like the only question I can always, uh, that's the only answer I can ever give for someone. I know what my experience has been. And I luckily came into the art world at a, at a tremendous time for female minority artists. Um, so maybe we can just go one genera one time. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, Sheila, you're the, the, the oldest. I'm the man. oldest. <laughs> I mean, I I'm, love the, it. I'm the oldest, but you're the oldest artist. <laughs> um, I would say that, I'm going to say something kind of crazy. I don't think it's because I was a woman necessarily, because I, I was a woman r at the right time to be active, but I, I think it's because I'm a woman from a, Southern, second generation, Southern Italian, Jersey. You know, dad had a seventh grade education and made sure that his girls got out of the house to have an education, which was, that was the, you know, that was the thing. How do you get your daughters to have a liberal arts education and not have your mother like flip her lid because her daughters are now mala femina, you know? Um, getting out of that small brain, um, the, my art was the thing that led the way, so that was my saving grace, right? The art just, if I held onto the art, I might find a way out, out, out of um, a small world. So, you know, there, I, I remember watching a film of, um, uh, Frankenthaler talking about the judge. And I was like, who's the judge? And it was like, oh, the judge was her father. And I just thought, okay, I have no idea what that means. So it is a construction of many parts, right? It's a miracle that I'm sitting here with you. If I hadn't gotten out of that environment, I'd probably be another 100 pounds and have like several dozen grandchildren running around. <laughs> Or I would have gone into the convent. I think I would have gone into the convent. <laughs> um, so it's a combination. We all know that it's a, it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing. I, I just want to add that there have been times when I've been complaining. Um, I've been in personal conversations complaining about the, my, the progress in my career and the response sometimes is, well, you should be grateful that you're able to make work and have a practice. And, and that response at this point has, it tends to make me angry because of the economic piece of, um, it's discarding the economic piece that um, I see a lot I see more of an ease. Um, uh, for I, I, it's it's been difficult as a woman to participate in the economic piece. Let's just say that. You know, I when I started out as a dealer in the '70s, uh, there were very few women, obviously, who were making sculpture, but there were very few women who were um, considered part of the canon and um, whose whose work you could actually sell. I mean, that people wouldn't say, I, but she's a woman, you know, it's, I like that work, but um, that changed radically uh, in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s. Today, I don't even think it's a factor. It's a, it's a plus factor in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, I was saying before that I looked around my loft and realized that almost everything hanging there was by a woman, which had never even occurred to me. When I, when I bought the work. So I think that, that it, the marketplace has changed. I don't know whether the underlying attitudes have changed as, as much, um, but I think um, we're in a much better place today <laughs> than we have been. And, um, you know, I think 
the limitations which have to do, which may have to do with the things that are inherent in, in gender uh, are things that all can be dealt with and overcome. And as you said, the economic issues mm -hmm. are probably a bigger part of an artist's problems today than anything else. But the economics are for all women. Oh yes, so it's true. It's I mean, a, I mean that's, that's the thing. And for all We're artists. Alone. That's yeah. the good news yeah. <laughs> and the bad news. <laughs> I think we probably reached a, a natural conclusion here. We I have, have one, one more question. question. Yeah. I'm very struck by some of the comments about, especially the 10 year old playing and wanting to continue to find that 10 year old in your work. And I'm wondering if you could speak just a little bit, all of you, about at what point in your development did you know you wanted to be an artist? And how did you persevere in that? Because I think that's an aspiration many women have, but it gets socialized out of them. And then it's, I think, not surprising that later in life, so many women in midlife and in retirement are painting and uh, doing weaving, sculpture, and as, an, as amateurs. So I'm wondering, how did you keep that alive? At what point did you know you wanted to do that? I, I, was an, I knew I was an artist at a really young age. Um, and my parents were incredibly, incredibly supportive. And when they saw my senior thesis exhibition and had been hassling me throughout college to take business classes <laughs> as well, um, they saw my exhibition and they said, OK, you're going to do it. Um, it's also um, a way to survive. Like, I do it. It's like, I need to do it. Um, and so I just keep making it. I was also a very young artist, same situation. My parents were really supportive. Um, and last night, I was talking to Tony about her time with Elaine de Kooning and, you know, what it was like, what was she saying about being a female artist? And she said that they just, they didn't even talk about it at that point. It's just like you don't you don't complain about it, you're just doing it. And um, I think one thing that is incredibly painful is when you have a truth or a talent that you can't share. And there's something about um, needing to accomplish that or work through that or find a way to express and share that um, that made me want to keep going and keep pushing. And I think what makes all artists kind of like What's the word for it? Tortured, <laughs> in a way. Um, so, I think of art as a job, you know, that you go to every day and you do it. And I, I'm always upset when people think it's some sort of inspiration or you know a gift, where it's actually a problem-solving job. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were um, good. 10 years, nine years that I didn't make any art. Um, I was a lesbian separatist, I worked on farms, I picked vegetables, I, then I left the separatists because they were too separate and uh, <laughs> started working in museums and hoped that I could have a career in museums to be useful. That was the, you should be useful, Sheila. Um, and it didn't, work. I mean, it didn't stick. I think it's it's like what my friends in AA talk about getting up every day and choosing not to. For me, I, have, I get up every day and choose to. And um, it's a job. And, and a, it only works for me if I know that at some point I could w not do it. It's that delicate that I could get up one morning and say, you know what? I want to go study astrophysics now, or something radically different, because it's precious, but also a job. Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> oh, would you please help me thank these extraordinary women? Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I, 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 I feel like the luckiest person in the world. Um, I don't know really how I got this lucky, but um, through this uh, series of panels, I've had the opportunity to meet and talk with some really extraordinary artists, curators, collectors, um, and it's really been a gift for me. And, um, you know, these are very busy 
uh, artists, and Barbara took the time to talk to each one of them, as you can see, uh, pr prior to this, um, the panel today, made studio visits, and I'm just deeply grateful to all of you for the time uh, that you've put in. Alice I've known since her daughter was about six months old. Um, Barbara I just met this year, and the rest I met last night and this morning. Um, and I just that you would say yes to do this is extraordinary to me. I do want to mention that uh, Alice's daughter, Soren, uh, has a show at Duck Creek, um, which is several miles down on Three Mile Har Harbor um, Road. You really need to see this show. She is extraordinarily talented. It's five paintings, and they're really beautiful. Um, I just, I can't. Uh, urge you enough. I think it's open today and tomorrow. To Weekends? Is it six and, by appointment. and and Duck Creek is incredibly beautiful um, art space that's been open for like the past six or seven years. Um, I also want to I want to thank um, my studio manager Janet Golias, who uh, this would so not happen uh, without her. <laughs> Um, she's not only helped to prepare all of the um, things that we received today, but also reaching out to artists and really helping to uh, create panels of, of real meaning. And um, also Jonathan Martyr, who's worked on all the logistics uh, from the very beginning and planted the seed in my tiny brain. Um, this, yeah.